Breaking the News with Des Clark. Hi, I'm Des Clark and welcome to Breaking the News, the best of 2019, where we take a look back at the news we broke over the past 12 months. Now, the big story, not just of 2019, but the last few years, has of course been Brexit. It's dominated the news agenda and led to the first winter general election since 1923. And coincidentally, Brian Taylor covered that one as well. At the start of the year, Theresa May survived many common setbacks and a confidence vote before eventually resigning and triggering a Tory party leadership race where Boris Johnson became Prime Minister. Bad news for his hairdresser, good news for topical comedy shows. But it turned out his approach to Brexit, unbelievably, was fraught with difficulty. In a moment, comedians Janie Godley and Neil Delamere tear Brexit up. But first, to help provide some much-needed clarity, here's comedian Jay Lafferty. So the way I understand it is that Parliament have said no to Theresa's deal and they've said no to no deal, but some of them said yes to no deal, but no to Theresa's deal. But not as many that said no to no deal and no to Theresa's deal, but they don't actually have a deal of their own, which is a big deal because without a deal, then no deal is more likely to be the deal that's dealt and the people who want the deal can't be dealing with that. (laughs) On a side note, I think the reason Theresa's voice has gone isn't that she's, you know, like over-talking. I think every single night when everybody goes away, she stands at the back of 10 Downing Street and just puts and goes, ah! (laughs) <laughs> for like an hour because I'm sure that's why her throat's sore because that's what I do when I see her She is worried that if there's a hard Brexit under the next Tory PM that uh, there'll be a breakup of the union If you look at how popular Boris Johnson is in Scotland <laughs> um, there's a very good chance of that Boris Johnson's rating he has a minus 37 approval rating in Scotland Tuberculosis is minus 10 <laughs> Where I live in Perth, you might have not think that things like Brexit affect it, things, but it is. It's true because you know farming is very dependent on the subsidies in the EU. And, uh, but even I noticed in the cowshed this morning, there's a lot of tension now <laughs> between between the native breeds, you know, the Aberdeen Angus and the Hereford, <laughs> and and the French bred limousines and charlie cattle. A lot of tension going on there. those Frisians uh, coming in, lording uh, it up. Yes, uh, the, the Dutch Frisians, of course. But, of course, the Swiss bred swimmittles, they're just, they're just neutral. <laughs> Brexit. Yes. Uh, it is, but, but, and you have to say it in that voice, don't you? Yes. Brexit. Still. Oh. And I don't know which bit of Brexit. A lot has happened this week. Yeah. It's like, as a nation... We've agreed to have a threesome. Like, say, (laughs) this is my analogy. Stay with it, right? Say me and my husband, we agree we're going to have a threesome, and then I bring Jim into the bedroom, and my husband goes, but that's not what I had in mind. (laughs) But I go, but it is a threesome. When's the vote for that? (laughs) Jim, how, how long's your extension? <laughs> <laughs> the big thing will be shortages in... Um, I read this today and it really made me laugh. Shortages in supermarkets of vegetables, which, of course, being Glaswegian, you won't care about, but... I... <laughs> <laughs> But apparently the big problem will be, of course, we can stockpile certain foods, you know, tinned foods, etc. but it's fresh food that we'll struggle to stockpile. And we'll particularly struggle to stockpile because the deadline for Brexit is the, is the 31st of October and warehouses will already be full of Christmas goods by that point. <laughs> From the October onwards, we're just sitting around in candlelight eating Ferrero Rocher and mince pies, going, <laughs> yes! Sounds all right, doesn't yeah. it? They seem to fucking happy with that. <laughs> I met a woman at a comedy gig and I said to her, where are you from? She said, the Netherlands. And I said, if I give you £50 just now, will you get me migraine tablets in December? And she said, aye. <laughs> and in that moment, I got a better deal than Boris did. <laughs> <laughs> So that was Brexit there, our thanks to comedians Jim Smith, Zoe Lyons, Andrew Maxwell and Joe Caulfield. 
Now in Scotland, it's not just Brexit that's at the forefront of people's minds, but also Scottish independence. At the SNP party conference, Nicola Sturgeon set out that a second referendum on Scottish independence must happen in 2020. And the subject was debated again during the general election. You'll hear award-winning crime writer Val McDermott and comedian Stuart Mitchell's take on the indie debate. But to kick us off again, it's Jay Lafferty to tell us who she thinks is really encouraging a move to independence. I think it's interesting to look at uh, how the notion of independence has gone from being like a dream held by idealists to being a pragmatic reality. <laughs> and it doesn't matter where your politics lie, but you can't deny that one political party has campaigned tirelessly and relentlessly to make independence seem feasible. And for that, I would like to thank the Tories. <laughs> um, I think it's fair to say that it's on the way. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly I'll be having words with Nicola Sturgeon if it's no. no. <laughs> she said, I, 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 was, I, was, I was at a festival in England with Nicola recently and, uh, and she said she really likes being in England with me because it means she's not the most chippy Scotswoman in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting when you're in England, though, as a comedian, English people, they always say, what do you think independence? And I always say to them, I'm quite honest, I don't think you'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere that you could buy in the world, why? If you're asking me as an English person if there's one place I'd like to buy, uh, it would be Scotland. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> so I will buy Scotland and prevent you people going independence. Not because, I don't, not because I don't think you should be allowed to control your own political future, but because I'm English and I don't want to be left alone with England. <laughs> such a divisive topic man mm. you know like <laughs> it split my family up as well like my, I was a yes voter my mum and dad were wrong about it like there was so many <laughs> equally valid points of view <laughs> like uh, I just remember like the moment I found out like I woke up in the morning because uh, the results came out at night but I've got a bedtime and uh, <laughs> came down the stairs and my mum was sitting in the couch and she had a big smile on her face. You know, she was watching the news and it said 55% and I was like, I don't know how you can do this to this country. We finally had the chance to steer the rudder of its own ship and you've dashed that ship upon the rocks. I'll fight for Scottish independence till my bones crumble like stale shortbread and I'll scream Viva La Caledonia for the rooftops until my lungs are but the dry, haggard, droning ways of the bagpipe. I would rather die on my feet today than live forever on my knees. <laughs> and my mum said, well, if you like independence so much, then why don't you get your own flat? Um... <laughs> I was like, no thanks. <laughs> We're better together. Um... We never did find out if Chris moved out. Thanks to comedian Christopher MacArthur Boyd and writer comedian Andy Zaltzman. Now, climate and eco-awareness were big in 2019 with reports that we're heading over the brink and towards climate catastrophe. Extinction Rebellion protesters glued themselves to everything, from pavements in London to the front of Joe Swinson and Boris Johnson's election battle buses. And I've done my bit for the planet too. I've been using the same plastic straw for the last nine months. Ugh. In these clips, you'll hear comedians Alan Cochran and Scott Agnew discussing all things activist. But to begin, here's Zoe Lyons giving us her idea of a, let's say, sustainable modern business. Well, unfortunately, I'm, I'm quite a big carnivore, so I'd like to make it a sustainable meat restaurant where it's sort of carbon neutral. So what I'd combine it with is people always like burgers and people always die. So it's... a <laughs> It's a barbecue crematorium amalgamation <laughs> where we're using the heat from one source to cook. <laughs> it, it's a, it, I think it's almost carbon neutral. Um, and it would be called um, Over My Dead Body. Um, It's one of these things, Alan, where there's some people that agree with the cause but don't agree with how the protesters have gone about it. I think there's a real divide about 
how they go about it. For me, especially when they did the London one, where if, if you're not aware, they, they glued themselves to the Docklands Light Railway. And, and my middle class friends were all like, oh, this is great, it's raising awareness of the environmental issues. And my working class friends were more like, what glue's that? <laughs> um, it's quite hard to get glue that can put skin to a hard surface. Environmentalists are great folk just to sort of wind up. In my previous life as a journalist, I was a reporter for the Rutherglen Reformer, which is not easy to say by a drink in you, but <laughs> I, and we would frequently do stories about uh, when they were building the M74. We used to have this local couple, uh, David and Jane, and they, you could honestly, you could get them to start a protest at the drop of a hat, right? You would just phone David or Jane up and go, by the way, we're heard them knocking down this building and she'd be chained to a bulldozer naked within half an hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was always great in a slow news day. It was, it was absolutely brilliant. I can't say I've ever read the Rutherglen Reformer, but I might do now. That was great. Yeah, it was a big year for Donald Trump, of course. Well, he thinks every year is big. It's such a big year. So big, so big. It's beautiful, it's big. I gave a medal to a dog. I met the Queen, beautiful woman, and called President Trudeau two-faced. But as the US gears up for another presidential election, we got to know more about who could take on Trump in 2020. Here's political commentator Aisha Hazarika and comedian Raymond Mearns on the similar demographic of the Democratic frontrunners. There are so many old white dudes in American politics. You've got Trump, you've got Sanders, you've got Biden. It's like a US remake of old tricks. And what I'm really worried about is that kind of that they don't confuse the nuclear button with their panic button. <laughs> I like the reverse of that, that they try and launch a nuke on Russia and a home help comes round. <laughs> <laughs> he's younger than Bernie. I think Aye. he's a year younger than Bernie. I think Bernie's 77. Jimmy Carter's still living, he's 95. Bush just died recently, he was, he was 94. And when Reagan died, he was 93. This guy's got years yet. Years in him, man. <laughs> in fact, the, the, he's that young, they refer to him as Joseph R. Biden Jr. What age is the dad? <laughs> <laughs> it is the news of the summit between US President Donald Trump and North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un. Susan Kalman, yes. what do you make of it then? Is this the two people that could partake in this year's Nobel Peace Prize? <laughs> 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 I mean, maybe. That's the problem. Could happen. That Who is knows? the problem. He's an extraordinary man, and at the same time, the Cohen hearings were going on uh, in America, where his personal lawyer was saying he's a racist and he's a liar. And you know that that's not going to make a blind bit of difference <laughs> to a lot of people who voted for him. That's the problem. Also, that's the case for the defence. Wait till you hear the prosecution. <laughs> <laughs> The great thing about Michael Cohen, I'll tell you Michael Cohen, because he just can't help himself. He was out at some dinner with a great friend of his and he just got onto the subject of when his, when his son was born. Mm. And he said, you know, when my son was born, he said, I, you know, I pushed, I pushed a doctor out of the way and I delivered my son myself. And his wife said, but that's nonsense. And he turned to her and said, shut up, you weren't even there. <laughs> So, Maisie, let's talk Trump then. He says he's not going to get involved in the election, then starts giving opinions on who he'd he rather work with. He can't resist, like, sticking his oar in. He's like, it, was, it was so obvious that Boris had been like, look, what would really help is if you just literally keep stum the whole time you're here. Just don't speak unless you're spoken to. And he did that, he did that little interview, didn't he, where he's like, I'm not, I'm not going to get involved, not going to do it. No, I'm not, gonna, I'm not interested in it. But I really like Boris, and I do think he's very capable. It was like, oh... <laughs> We'll see what about it then. Obviously, everyone already talking about it. There may be protests, but Trump is now coming to the UK. Well, the best thing about the last time was the Scottish reaction, because when you guys protest, you do it amazingly. I did actually, I, I was jotting down some of the slogans that were... Um, maybe you could translate some of these. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> may your ass break out in boils, you scunner. <laughs> That was on a banner. That was... That's poetry, that is. I don't know what a stunner is, but I'm pretty sure he is one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> go home, you big orange jobby. <laughs> <laughs> your moor was an immigrant, your tangerine roaster. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's also a Mother's Day card. <laughs> In the end, we all 
wonder about what will be the undoing of Trump, and I think it will be his naivety. He's granted two private audiences to Vladimir Putin, the leader of America's most potent enemy has been able to sit down with the president, a former leader of the KGB and FSB, although what the Federation of Small Businesses were doing getting involved is anyone's guess. <laughs> been able to sit opposite Trump. Now, quite apart from the information he would have definitely got out of Trump, it wouldn't surprise me if Putin has secreted a bugging device on him and he hasn't noticed yet. <laughs> I, and I just want to say, by the way, oh. I hear, I hear, I hear beeping at night. And... <laughs> Nobody knows what it is, by the way, nobody knows. I think, I, and I do, nobody knows. I think, I think it's my ideas coming in. Sorry. That was Matt Ford there doing a very good impression of me, Donald Trump. Also, thanks to comedians Susan Kalman, Rory Bremner, Maisie Adam, Mark Nelson and Lucy Porter. We have no idea what 2020 will bring for President Trump or the rest of US politics. But one thing is for sure, comedians will still be doing impressions of Donald Trump for a long time to come. They're going to be so good. It's fair to say nobody is safe in breaking the news. And if you've been in the news, you're fair game. Politicians, celebrities, people of note and Willie Rennie. Coming up is comedian and impressionist Lewis McLeod. But we start with Jim Smith and... Uh, a Des Clark, oh I, I know that guy, who for some reason thought it was wise to do Andy Murray impressions in front of Andy's mum, Judy Murray. Off topic, uh, you know Des and me both do Andy Murray impressions, but we're both too polite or scared to do them today. <laughs> We've got to slow it right down and get the cro croakiness of the voice there. And get, yeah, like Monopoly, I just used to go mad. <laughs> I actually made the mistake of not only doing it to Judy, I did it to Jamie and to Andy as well, <laughs> which was really bad. I was trying to do a, an Andy Murray impression to, to Andy, and they said, that kind of sounds a little bit like me. And I said, that's the idea of an idiot. <laughs> and then he turned around to me and said, who's that idiot? <laughs> and I said, it's your son. <laughs> Something you would have on prescription that wasn't already on there. Jeremy Vine. <laughs> Jeremy Vine? I mean, he's not on the telly enough, right? I mean, he's, <laughs> you've, got, you've got... Hello, Jeremy Vine. You have two hours of Jeremy Vine in the morning. <laughs> and then you take your medication at lunchtime, 12 till 2. <laughs> and then early in the evening when his voice slows down because you've overdosed slightly on Jeremy Vine. <laughs> You've got half an hour of eggheads in the evening. <laughs> and all we need to complete the circle is a little bit of Jeremy Vine in the evening. <laughs> www.jeremy.vine.bbc.co.uk <laughs> Jo Swinson could lose her seat in Eastern Bartonshire, like she said, the Lib Dems. So she says that she thinks she can become Prime Minister, but I think that just goes to show like the level of like delusion that you can have if you're brought up in Mogai. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I love about Lewis Capaldi is just like his sheer shock at being as successful as he is, because like, that's the whole thing. We're not good with success in Scotland, and it's it's no coincidence that all Scottish success stories are not known for their looks. Do you know what I mean? Like we've got the Proclaimers. Now, Lewis, like, if they were aesthetically beautiful, they would be working Saturday jobs at Livingston Outlet Mall. <laughs> Sarah, the phenomenon that is Lewis Capaldi, is, is he on your radar yet? He is, and I was just thinking, I view him as sort of the anti-James Corden. <laughs> like, when you're watching James Corden, there's this routine all the time of, like, oh, look, ma... Not, not literally, but sort of, like, behind the eyes. Like, when he's pretending that he experiences emotion. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like, it's like, oh, wow, can you believe it? I'm on telly, ma... Wow. And it's like, you've been working your whole life for this and thrown everyone under the bus to get there, and I see you for what you are, you sociopath. That's just me, but you guys have your own... <laughs> what about you, Judith? I know that you talked about getting selfies. Have you ever had a selfie with, selfie with a famous person? Is there a right way to go about it? The Queen Mother. The Queen Mother? <laughs> God, how far down did you have to oh. dig?
Ah, uh, Judith Ralston there. A forecast for hilarity as always. Also, thanks to comedians Mark Jennings and Sarah Barron. Now, as we trundled towards a December election, we kept up with all the latest goings-on from the campaign trail. Unfortunately, we couldn't afford a breaking the news election bus, but I did manage to spray my name to the side of a Nissan Micra. Following the campaigns for us were comedians Jamie McDonald and Amy Matthews, but firstly, Ahir Shah on the pure joy he gets from general elections. I think that uh, a lot of negativity is uh, put towards politicians these days, but I think it's very considerate that every party has insisted on putting their representatives on television every single day as a daily reminder that I need to take my antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is the thing. Obviously, there's lots of promises coming about and politicians saying we'll do this, that and the other. Are you swayed by any of it, Amy? A political promise has about as much commitment as a gym membership in January, doesn't it? <laughs> Danny DeVito came out and said, vote for Corbyn. <laughs> the equivalent of that over here is like Jeanette Cranky back in Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, how about you on this idea of celebrity endorsements? Would it sway you to vote for one person or another? Oh, no, really. We've got our, our mind made up. I mean, I, I had to go and Google who Stormy, Stormzy was. Stormy. Stormy. Stormzy is a, he's a badass rapper. But where I come from in Persia, that's someone that puts that cling film around the silage bales. <laughs> Well, look, anything can happen. A Christmas election, as you say, Mark, is very unusual. Do you think it'll work in terms of voter turnout and getting people engaged? Uh, it's hard to say, like, because they're trying to get a lot of more young people engaged in politics now, aren't they? And I've always thought what they should do if they wanted to get young people into politics is, like, release a kind of Real Housewives-style TV show called The Spouses of Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of younger people as well are sort of saying like, they don't like that older people are voting on stuff that's going to affect their future, right? And I don't think you should take the votes away from older people, but what I think they should do is just change it so that everyone has to vote on machines that are like self-service checkouts that old people <laughs> don't know how to use. <laughs> Mark Jennings there winning the popular vote. My pal, comic and farmer Jim Smith joined me as a regular panellist this year and I learned a lot about him and farming life. I found out that a tup is a ram, that I have the right size hands for lambing season and that Jim isn't great with numbers. We always put the tups in on bonfire night, 7th of November, because mm. that means they're lambing, start lambing, or the ewes start lambing the 1st of April. 7th so, of November? Aye. Well, no, when's, when's bonfire night? The 5th. <laughs> <laughs> So they're in, they're I mean, the, the whole phrase is, remember, remember, to him, the 7th of November. Sorry. No wonder he's like, nobody else is letting off fireworks. <laughs> I don't, I've always been conscious of my Persia accent, because I never really thought I had an accent either, until I went to... I think it's helped you, but, mate. It's yes, just, it did. It really has helped you stand it, out. Well, it's good for the comedy, but it's not great for, like, chatting up girls or something, you know? <laughs> I can't seduce a girl in the bedroom by subtly whispering into her ear, because I've got this booming voice, you know. <laughs> I can't whisper into her ear. I think I am, but I end up sounding like a train station announcer. <laughs> <laughs> I take your pants off, it's nothing to do with your things. Thank you. <laughs> well, I was trying to think of some big Hollywood names that I do. I've done Scottish accents before, so Michael Caine. Jim, it's just farmer Jim. Get the bloody sheep. And then get the cows <laughs> and give them some turnips. <laughs> you are supposed to blow the bloody tractor doors. <laughs> Jim Smith there, and you also heard from, surprisingly, Michael Caine. So we've had a look at Brexit, Trump, Scottish politics, and what date Bonfire Night is actually on. But to finish, here are some clips that are so strange and unusual, we couldn't put them anywhere else. They don't have a home, so I look after them here. Yes, for just no pounds a month, you too can have an unnamed random clip in your house. 
Soon you'll hear comedians Elaine Malcolmson on Breakfast and Jamie McDonald on Rambo 4. But first, comedian Susie McCabe has a wolf problem. I live in the east end of Glasgow and I live quite close to a park and we have wolves. I have... <laughs> I've seen some crossbreeding of dogs. <laughs> I was actually walking through a park and an owl came out the woods and this guy who must have been about 16, 17 turned round to his mates and went, did anybody see that owl? <laughs> I didn't think they existed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was just a creature from Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> What about generally Scottish foods? Are you a fan? Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing that really interests me is the square sausage. Uh -huh. Yeah, or as I like to call it, corrugated bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Go to all that effort making it square and then put it in a round roll. <laughs> yeah. Is there something in your life that really annoys you? Uh, oh, I mean, many things. The one thing I was, I, was, I was think, like, um, I, I sometimes, because of, of my essay, I don't get taken seriously in, in, in various areas. And, so, and one of them is, is casual uh, conversation, right? Because I, I was in the pub with some of my able-bodied friends. Right? And we got talking about action films, right? And no joke, I said I'd enjoyed the film Rambo 4, mm. to which my mate said, how the hell do you know? Oh. And before I could say, you know, it's got audio description. You know, Rambo takes out the helicopter with a bazooka. Go, Rambo. Right? <laughs> right, my other mate said, ah, it's cool. He'll have read the book. <laughs> so that is it. The news is broken. Will we be able to do the same in 2020? Join us next year to find out. I'll leave you now with a story from Judy Murray about the footballing legend Sir Alex Ferguson. I've been Des Clark. All the best for the new year. Can I ask you, is he a good chat, Alex Ferguson? Because I know you've met him a few times. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Des, I know that's you. No, 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 I'm um, not. He's it, really great company. He's very, very wise and he can be very funny. And um, we were at Wimbledon one year and he'd sent me a text saying he was coming to the Royal Box and he said, are you around for a cup of tea? So we go up, we have a cup of tea and a donut and then he has to go to the Royal Box. And I said, do you know where you're going? And he said, not from here, from where we were. And I said, oh, I'll walk down with you. What a mistake, because he's so famous. And as soon as we hit the main thoroughfare, he got absolutely mobbed. And he just keeps walking. And Andy was that day playing a Spanish player called Fernando Verdasco. And a Spanish journalist with a great big camera started walking. He's walking backwards, so we're walking towards him. So he's walking backwards. Sir Alex, Sir Alex, a few words for the Spanish media. And he said, adios, amigo. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.